Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered today on the 16th of the fifth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with the 29th of July, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the book of Bereshit, or Genesis, which literally means in the beginning. So... We had already covered the first seven chapters before we took a break on the book of Hanok or First Enoch, and now we are coming back to here. If you follow along with the last few weeks, you can see what was covered. And again, there is a separate account of the flood, both a parable of it in the book of First Enoch or Hanok, where it's foretold that it would happen. There's a parable in the animal apocalypse of it happening. And then you see the actual events in the Dead Sea Scrolls with a, with an, a, an account that lines up with the calendar in there. So this is from chapter 8 of the book of Bereshit. It says, And Elohim remembered Noach, or Noach, right, comfort and rest, and all the beasts and the cattle that were with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of the Shemaim were stopped. And the rain from the Shemaim was withheld. And the waters receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of the hundred and fifty days, the water diminished. And in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the new month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, which we know is in modern Turkey. In antiquity, this place was known as Uratu. Excuse me. It was the kingdom of, of Uratu, and they were actually destroyed by the Sumerians, or the Cimmerians, if you will, who, if... We were just talking about that a little earlier, but for those that don't know, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity by Assyria. The last place that they took captive was the, the city of Samaria, or Shamarun, if you will. And when everyone had fled to the city there, it was pretty packed. A lot had left beforehand, which is a different story. But when they were taken, they were known as the House of Omri, which the Babylonians called Gumri with a K or a G, and the Assyrians called Kumri with a K. It's literally with an I in. We use Omri O in English, but it's a it's the same letter that can be an O. The I in is literally the I, and it can also be a G like Gamora, which uses the I in. So there's um there's evidence for it there, but the Semitic tends to have that as a gutter like Gomorra, and that's where they get the Gumri or Kumri from. And that Kumri was the Simri of the Greeks or the Sumerians. When they were taken by the Assyrians, they were put as a defender or a kind of a buffer zone of their northern border. And the kingdom directly north of that area was the kingdom of Uratu. They rose up and attacked the Assyrians. Our brother is about to join, so I'll wait for him. But um, the kingdom of Aratu at that time rose up to attack the Assyrians, and the buffer state, the Sumerian, the Sumerians rose up, defended themselves, and then went and destroyed that kingdom. And they kind of took over that area and started migrating to the north and west from that point. They were no longer staying where they were. But just for a background of where this area is at, specifically on where the Ark rested, you can find that information from our brother who's no longer with us, Ron Wyatt. And he there's quite a few discoveries of Ron Wyatt, the... the there's one YouTube channel called the Ark Discoveries. The other one is specific for his in his name, and it has the documentaries of the things that he found. But the Ark literally was resting on the mountains by the Turkish Iran border, and it was it's it was known. It was discovered in the seventies and eighties. At the time, they actually even made a an exhibit out of it, so people can 
tourists can go to see it. I don't know if it's still available or not. This is in the waters decrease steadily until the 10th new month. In the 10th new month, on the first day of the new month, the tops of the mountains became visible. And it came to be at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven, which kept going out and turning back until the waters had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for its feet and returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of all the earth. So you see, this is also explained in some of the apostolic writings, as they call them, or the renewed covenant writings, as a parable of foretelling with the raven being sent out and then the dove and what that represents and how the dove was sent out not once but twice, right? And how the third time it was released, it does not return, but or it, it, it has the fleshly or freshly plucked olive leaf in its mouth and everything that that foretells. Just keep these things in mind because they come up again and again, especially with all the leaves, doves, and um, fleeing to the wilderness and whatnot. For those of you that might not be aware, America was known as the Great Wilderness, and Columbia is literally the county or the district of the dove. But it says, and it, yeah, and it came to be at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he's, I read this one, I'm sorry. So then he sent out a dove from him to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for its feet and returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of all the earth. And while the raven would land on carrying or dead things that might be floating, doves would not. That's why it returned to him. So he put out his hand and took it and pulled it into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark, and the dove came to him in the evening. And see, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in its mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. And he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him again. And it came to be in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the new month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second new month, on the 27th day of the new month, the earth was dry. Now, in the book of Yobelim, and on in the account that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a little bit of discrepancy here, but generally they all cover the same thing. It was on the 17th of the second month, exactly one year from the beginning of the floods, the ground was dry, and he waits another 10 days, and everyone is leaves the ark on the 27th, is what you can see when you compare all of these things together. And Elohim spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you, and bring out with you every soul from all flesh that is with you, or every inner being, the nephesh, right? Which the nephesh is in the blood. It's the soul that's in the blood, not your life. But it says, Of birds, of cattle, and all creeping things, the creeping creatures on the earth, and let them teem on the earth and bear an increase on the earth. And Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast 
every creeping creature and every bird, whatever creeps on the earth according to every or according to their kinds, went out of the ark. And Noah built an altar or slaughter place to Yahuwah. and took of every clean beast and of every clean bird and offered ascending offerings on the slaughter place. And Yahuwah smelled a soothing fragrance, and Yahuwah said in his heart, Never again shall I curse the ground because of man, although... The inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and never again strike all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And that is a promise that we can count on as an established fact because it's the covenant that he made with Noah with his bow, right? And if you have a reasonable mind and you think about it, every one of these conditions are still true even to our day, every year. <clears throat> Chapter 9. And Elohim Barak, Noah, and his sons, and said to them, Poru Oravu, Right, it's uh, the same thing he in, enjoined to Adam and Hua or Eve. It says, "Be fruitful, and increase." That word for fruitful is Peru, just like the state or the country of Peru in South America, which is literally the Hebrew word for fruitful, just like Brazil is the Hebrew word for iron, which are the things that are indicative of those areas. He says, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth and the fear of you and the dread of you is on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the Shemaim or heavens, on all that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they have been given. Every creeping creature that lives is food for you. Now, every creature is what he says here. Later on, it's enjoined for the children of Israel alone that there are certain things that are unclean not to be eaten. And later on, at the enjoyment of the renewed covenant, the uh, the heathens or the paganized people are told not to eat blood or what's strangled and to learn every Shabbat the Torah of Moshe so that they can conform themselves to it. And you'll find that no matter where you look, you won't see where he's changed the, the dietary instructions. A second or a third witness for this fact, for anyone that wants to think about it, is we are the literal living temple or dwelling place of the Almighty in our body. And you will never find where he makes an unclean offering acceptable in his temple. So, Ab willing, anyone with a reasonable mind can see that can read plainly where it says we're prohibited from certain things as not considered food, and then you will, to your benefit, abstain from them. Because it anybody can see, for example, in the New Testament, as it's called, that Yahushua sent a legion of demons into a herd of pigs that women were using. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if pigs are a means through which demons are, we don't want to consume that. Uh, for obvious reasons. But it says, Every creeping creature that lives is food for you. I have given you all as I gave the green plants, but do not eat flesh with its soul, its blood. Even so, only your blood for your souls I require. From the hand of every beast I require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I require the soul of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood is shed. This is an eternal statute. And remember, it's because of the guilt, blood guilt on the land, because this very thing is not done. 
that there is compounded sin. And that is even true to our day in the keeping of the things like Christmas and Easter. People make light of it, but the scriptures literally say that the blood of all the saints, the blood of all the Kodeshim, the set-apart ones, all the foretellers, from Hevel, or Abel, to Zechariahu, the father of Yahukanon, all the blood of them would be held against those people who were violating his word. And he doesn't change. So we have been given these things and so much more because this is now the time after he came to which there is no excuse for what we're doing. We literally have the truth present with us. It was foretold in America specifically that the Bible or his word would never be taken from us, and it hasn't. But uh, that's why we are being so severely judged for the things we are doing wrong as a nation without being, uh, without excuse. So it says, And Elohim spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, see, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living soul that is with you, of the birds, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, and I shall establish my covenant with you, and never again is all flesh cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again is there a flood to destroy the land or earth. And this means there will never again be a universal or what we call a worldwide flood. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between you and me and every living soul that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my bow, what we call the rainbow, but the Hebrew just has the bow, right, like the arch. I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And this is explained in what is called the recognitions of Clement, which is the teachings and preachings of Shimon Kepha, or who's called Simon Peter. It's like the book of Acts for his works and what he did. In there, one of his taught ones, a brother of Clement, either Achilla or Nasita, I can't remember which, um, they're explaining as they're sharing the good news with Kepha there watching because he taught them and then he went with them as they were sharing as well, training them to do the same works that he was. Excuse me. But it was explained that the sign of the covenant with the rainbow was the same as a man using a signet ring to stamp something as an official seal for, for something with the sun cloud and then the imprint being with the rainbows. That was just like someone with a signet wax and making a seal. So because of the pattern in it, a man with reason can comprehend what is being done. But when you think about what a rainbow is in creation, there's no sense to it outside of that. I mean, what does a, a arch of light have of any beneficial value? It's of no substance. It's physical. It's only in the mind of a man that can comprehend these truths that can see, well, that's the purpose. And that is one of the arguments that was used by the children of Clement's father to try to convince him of the truth before they knew who he was. And that, again, is in what's called the Recognitions of Clement. It's titled that because it's really the story of Kepha's preaching surrounded around the life of Clement of Rome and his being brought from a non-believer into being a believer that is uh, writing these writings and writing down the preaching and teaching of Kepha and sending them into them. He was the responsible party for writing the recognitions and also what's called the homilies. He was responsible for writing the making copies of what was called the shepherd of Hermas. And he was the one that was responsible for making copies of what's called the apostolic constitutions and sending them out to the different bishoprics or the overseers throughout the land at that time. 
just for a little bit of context to the history of these people and what was going on, right? It says, uh, and I will bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living soul of all flesh. And never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow or the bow shall be in the cloud. And I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living soul of all flesh that is on the land or earth. And Elohim said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And as we've read before, and we will cover again when we get to it, this covenant happened to land on the 15th of the third month, just like every covenant that our Creator has ever made. And that is happens to be when the, the truth was born into the world. I believe that's when our Mashiach was physically born as well. And that's also when his body was born again with the renewed covenant and the giving of the Ruach, which is what that was fully culminated in. It says, And the sons of Noah went out of the ark, or sorry, who went out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Yepheth which is name, fame, reputation, where you're at or who you are, your character and your name. It also means there, here or there, right? Literally where you're at. Ham is to be hot, all right? Um, the Greek word alchemy comes from the Hebrew alchemy, which is to spark or to to uh, ignite, if you will, to cook, to heat up, and that's what alchemy was. They would they would brew stuff, if you will, and then Yefeth is he will enlarge. Feth is petal, like the opening of a mouth, and ya ya or yod at the beginning is like the working hand, and it means he will or he is. So it says he will enlarge the tents of Yepheth, and that's why he was called that when he was given his name. That's what that means. He will enlarge. Ham is warmth, and Shem is name, fame, character, renown, where you're at, what you're known for. Noach is comfort and rest. And these are important because if you keep in mind what the names mean and you think about the stories, it's all about the good news. It's, it's pretty amazing stuff. This is in Ham was the father of Canaan. And that really should be a cue, I believe. These were the three sons of Noah and all. Actually, that was not. That was Cain at the beginning. I'm sorry. And all the earth was overspread from them. And Noah, a man of the soil, began and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Yepheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and went backward, not seeing the nakedness of their father, and covered the nakedness of their father but their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed is Canaan. Let him become a servant of servants to his brothers. This thing we just went over in what was called the Genesis Apocryphon by scholars from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's also known as the Tales of the Patriarchs in the new translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's the first-hand account writings of different people, Lemek, Noach, and Abram, or what we have left. In there, Noach is given a vision. When he has his wine, he's actually receiving a vision in parable form of like an olive tree that grows and has other trees produced and blooming underneath it to uh, represent his descendants from his time after the flood 
on to the you know presumably the end but we don't have it's all in fragments and in there in the vision he sees what ham did and that current cana on would be cursed and that's why it says when he wakes here he knew because he had already had the foretelling and he'd just seen the vision of what would be transpiring and he said baruch be yahuwah the elohim of shem and let cana on become his servant let elohim enlarge yepheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan become his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. And it mentions in Yobelim, which we will get to, that during these 350 years, he and his sons all kept the festivals that were enjoined and instituted by him specifically the first the 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 chodesh of the year the four remembrance days the first of the first month the first of the fourth month the first of the seventh month and the first of the tenth month but after his death they turned away from that and they went into idolatry when abram repented and started keeping the truth he reinstituted those days along with the rest of the festivals, as mentioned in the book of Yobelim, and it was kept by his children until they were in the land of Mitzrayim. Those that stayed true left, as I had mentioned before, and then the ones that were mixing with the Egyptians and their pagan idolatry and evils suffered enslavement and persecution. As they killed the firstborn of the Almighty with their disobedience to what he had given them, so it was reflected in their life with their firstborn being killed by Pharaoh. Um, just as the truth is represented, like the letter Gimel, um, the waters. Gimel goes along with the word Akob as two different words in Hebrew for the word or the meaning of reward. The other one is Shalom. Gimel or Gimel as a reward is like a boomerang. It's what you do, you throw it out and it makes its circuit, it goes its course and it comes back to you with its reward. It literally means a camel, which is the same you send it out with your goods or your efforts, your fruits, if you will. They go out and then after a time it will return to you with the, the, the recompense of the things that you sent out. And that's the idea of the gimel, that representative of the waters. And if you think about water, if you drop a drop of water in some, it makes a ripple. The ripples will go out, bounce, and come back at you. It's that very same phenomenon. That's what happened with Adam and how he acted in relation to our creator. It was represented in how his children were to him. You In, in Cain and Abel, if you will. And in Cain's line was the, the disobedience. And in Seth, what the one appointed was the repentance. In that very same thing, you see that firstborn rejection, secondborn acceptance thing that echoes through history, even culminating in Ephraim and Manasseh with the covenant Baraka or blessings from Jacob, right? Um, yeah, see, I lost track of what I was going there. But the... Uh, oh, yeah, it, you also see that in Aharon or Aaron, if you will, when he is the the means through which the children are led into idolatry in the wilderness right after making the covenant, but he repents, you still see it reflected in his children who bring strange fire before the altar and are consumed by it, all right? Where Aharon was responsible for the death of his two children with idolatry and the breaking of the covenant that happened then, his two children bringing the strange fire were consumed for it in that same manner. That theme carries over into kingdoms and households in the same capacity. You can find the example of as with the king, so with the people in the book of uh, Kings and Chronicles and the book of Gad the seer. You have three examples of when the children of Israel or the Bene Yisrael, if you will, were angering 
the Almighty. So he gave permission for the adversary to entice Dawid, their king, into sinning by numbering the people, where he had stated in his word emphatically that they are as the dust of the earth, as the sin, or not the dust of the earth, as a sand which is by the seashore, and as the stars of the Shamayim, right? innumerable in multitude and not to be numbered. So when he went and numbered them contrary to the word and will of our creator, that allowed the plague or that allowed the judgment to come to which he was given three choices. And he chose to fall into the hand of Yahuwah, which was Debir or pestilence, sickness that was sent through the people, right? And then Dawid is used as an intercessor. He has to at sacrifice and cost to himself, establish the place of the building of the Hekel. There, there's a whole bunch of things involved in it, both literally what happened and foretelling what it would be. That's a, We'll get into that as we get there. But the point is you can see example after example of the truth reflected in that kind of reward, which is the Gimel. That was the whole point. The other reward, just so you know, is Akob, like the the name Yaakov, which is literally, they call it surplanter, but it's he will catch at the heel, or literally he will get at the heel of what he's doing, his reward. And this is for those, as explained by Kepha, that are not maliciously evil. They don't plot out wickedness against people, and they just do things that are dumb. When you do things that are evil without intentionally being malicious and without being compelled to, you are punished more expediently in this life. You're corrected for it as a child being corrected for the foolish behavior they do by their parent. If you're malicious in your evil, you're not corrected in this life so much because you're incurring what's deserving of ageless fire. And that's why, and, and that's why it mentions in the Psalms that he was almost stumbled when he saw the wicked that are in in prosperity until he realized their end right so getting back on track here we've got one more chapter we can cover real quick this is Bereshit chapter 10 and it says this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah which we also covered in the uh, Genesis Apocryphon it is also in Yobelim which we'll cover again so you're going to see multiple witnesses of the names of them and generally the places that they might have went to it, I would encourage you comparing these, seeing what is confirmed and accurate and what seems to be divergent. So you, you should find things that are pretty interesting when you do so. This is, and this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. And the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Yepheth, Gomer and Magog, which, if you recall, we just shared that uh, there's a new anti-Christ or anti-Mashiach for Dummies video that came out yesterday, number 60. It happens to cover what we know as Armageddon or the information in the book of Revelation about Har Megiddo and what was actually transpiring during that time, which was the battles in the land of Palestine there during World War I that defeated the papal forces, destroyed the Turkish grip over there, and allowed the involvement of Ephraim and Manasseh, or the sons of Yahusuf, to help Yahuda, Ephraim and Yahuda, helping to return him to the land. So all of those things were foretold. They're not very well explained. But there's a second video that predates that one from the YouTube channel, christmasisalie.com where the Antichrist for Dummies series is and they go over Armageddon specifically it's quoting historical records it quotes the um, expositors and reformers through history for a few hundred years before it happened about who uh, what Armageddon was and who would be involved but also in there there's commentary about Antiochus Epiphans and when he was bringing to power his people, he, he used his main forces from northern Turkey that was from Gomer and Magog, the same place where they were to inherit that land, and then they moved and, and shifted around. 
So um, the tie-in for Gog and Magog right here are the forces or the uh, the armies that were used by Antiochus Epiphanes during the reign of the Greek Empire in Turkey after the Greeks took over from the Persians and the Medes and it broke into four different kingdoms. I believe this was what was spoken of with the first vision of beasts and the little horn that rose out of the Greek empire from the book of Daniel, possibly chapter eight. It might be chapter seven. The second vision, the one that he had himself of the beasts and, and things, does not cover this little horn, but covers the little horn out of the Roman empire that would be the fourth beast. So the sons of Yepheth, Gomer, and Magog, which would be the area around Turkey that we are familiar with, Madai, who was given what we call Spain, but petitioned his father-in-law to have an allotment in his area and was invited over by Elam, who we know as Persians, and Madai here became known as the Medes. All right. Madai's daughter, son of Yepheth, is also in the line of Abraham. She married uh, Selah, if I remember correctly. Yahweh is the father of the Greek people who Yahweh and Hebrews intermixing is what became the Greeks, as we've covered before. And we'll get into more detail when we get to that part in history. Tubal, Meshach, and Tiraz, right? All sons of Yepheth. They all got the islands or the, the little strips of land north of the Mediterranean from Turkey on to Spain. But again, Spain was abdicated by Madai. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, which everyone knows where that's at. A lot of people will attribute the Yahudim that went there as not being legitimate. But um, the, the Yahudim that went to Morocco were known as the, the Moroccan Yahudim. The Yahudim that went to Europe or Ashkenaz were known as the Ashkenazis. The Yahudim that went to Spain were, were known as the Sephardi. The, um, they were called by the area they went to. It was not that they were not Yahudim. So just for context there. But this is in uh, Europe, right above Turkey area, right? Ripfath and Torgama, right? And the sons of Yahweh, Elisha and Tarshish. Tarshish is actually in Spain. And that is whenever they mentioned the ships of Tarshish, it was the ships from Spain that they were, the Phoenicians were using. They were getting silver and copper, some gold out of there specifically. And the treasurer or the tax collector of the nations during the reign of Shalomo that's mentioned in the Bible was actually died and buried in Tarshish in Spain. His grave and the, and the, the tombstone and the writings about it were discovered in the 1800s and it's been known about for some time but forgotten by us. The sons of Yawan, right? Katim, this is what became, as we know them, is the Latinum people who went to Italy first and became the Latinum Confederation when the Hebrew paganized survivors of Troy, 80,000 of them, migrated into Italy. They intermixed with the Katim here and they became the Lat Latin people or, and founded the empire or the, the city of Rome that became, you know, the empire, the, the fourth beast kingdom that's still ruling today. And Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples of the nations were separated into their lands. The, again, the uh, places of the Mediterranean there. Everyone according to his language, according to their clans, into their nations. And the sons of Ham, Cush, what we call Ethiopia, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. This is Libya, right? All these places are in North Africa. There's no contest. There's no there's no contention about that. It's pretty well known. And then everyone knows where Canaan chose to locate, right? And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Chawila, 
or Havila, they call it, Sabtach and Ramah and Septika. And the sons of Ramah were Shiva and Dedan. And Cush brought forth Nimrod. Nimrod in the Greek is known as Nibrud, which you'll see in the book of Yobelim. His daughter married Eber, the first Hebrew, of which Abraham and all the Hebrews are descended from. So before Abraham was even born, you have the line of Shem as the, the paternal or father line, and you have both through their mothers in the genealogy, the lines of Japheth and Cush through Nimrod before Abraham is even born. That this is a, a thing for anyone that's contentious about what color your skin might be, if that is a thing for anybody. It says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, or Iraq, and Akkad and Kelne in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Asher and built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Er, and Kela and Rezin between Nineveh and Kelach, the great city. So Nimrod started in Babel, or what we call Iraq, and he built Babylon there, and then he spread himself north and kind of north to the northwest in the uh, Mesopotamian area between the rivers, if you will, building different places to found his first kingdom. And we'll get more context in different places. But the reason why people lose their liberty, are subject to men, have to listen to statutes or laws contrary to the, the Torah or the instructions given from our creator is because we choose not to have him as our head. So we get the enemy as our head because there's only two kingdoms. And he, as he mentioned to our Mashiach gives the reign to whomever he desires. That's why the the watchers of the Shemaim, when they are rebuking the king of Babylon, says that our creator puts the lowest of men in positions as kings. And this is also why the testament of Yahuda laments the witchcraft and idolatry of his children who would be kings over the people because of the things that they would choose to do. All right, it says, And Mitzrayim brought forth Ludim and Anim, or Ananim, and Lehabim, and Naphtuchim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluchim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtorim. And Canaan brought forth Zidon, his firstborn, and Chet, right? And the Yebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Huite, or the Hivite, right? And the Arkite, and the Sinite, and the Arwadite, and the Zamorite, and the Hamathite. And afterward, the clans of Canaanite, or the Canaanim, or Canaanites, if you will, were spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanim was from Zidon as you go toward Gerar, as far as Azah, as you go south toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adama, and Zeboim, as far as Lesha. Th these are all places, if you're not familiar with the geology or the geography in the land, these are all places within what they call Palestine or the land of Yahuda before it was taken over by Yahushua, the son of Nun, and the twelve tribes. It says, These were the sons of Ham according to their clans, according to their languages, in their lands, in their nations, and also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, or Avery, if you will, Evar, the brother of Yepheth the elder, children uh, were born. The sons of Shem were Elam, and Asher, and Aparkshad, and Lud, and Aram. The, and the sons of Aram, Uts, and Shul, and Gether, and Mash. 
Now, I can't claim anything for a park shed specifically, but with Elam and with Asher, we have examples of both of these men. Remember, Shem was the one in whom Yahuwah would, he would dwell in the tents of Shem, which means they were going to be held accountable for what they were doing. Elam was one of the first to unite men and reign as a tyrant against others and rise up and do violence against them. And because of his rising up and wiping out kingdoms and destroying things, himself and his nation and his name was wiped out. And that's why they didn't they weren't called Elamites anymore, but became known as Persians or the descendants that grew up out of that area afterwards. In the very same way, Asher was brought to power, became he was prospered, as the name implies, and then he became a pre type of those that would be like inquisitors doing horrible tortures and evil to people whenever they would sack cities they would make examples of the inhabitants that fought to kind of cow cower and cause fear into the inhabitants around them so that they would not fight and they just um what is that yield and submit to slavery if you will and because of their their tactics and their way of doing things they were as they did it was done unto them they were wiped out and that's why the assyrians are no more all right as elam was wiped out by abram when he was fighting to liberate lot the assyrians were whittled away when babylon came to power with the children of the northern kingdom known as scythians as mercenaries that were hired by them and as it mentions in the scriptures the children of Israel, the Bene Yisrael, were going to be his battle axe and his hammer, his sledging, his sledging thread, uh, threshing sledge, rather, that he was going to thresh the nations with. And literally throughout history, the literal seed of Abraham, specifically of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, have been used. And Yahuda, of course, is the leader because the, the kingly element and Yahuda has been amongst them all. Th that element is prevalent throughout as well. But they've been used to fight his battles and to bring judgment on the nations that are not walking in truth. They did it for Elam in Abraham. They did it for Asher as mercenaries with the Babylonians. They took out the Babylonians as mercenaries for the Persians. They had directly fought against the Persians in their own kingdoms and principalities outside of the country. Darius was killed by the Massagati when he attacked them, even though they were idolaters, but they were following some remnants of the truth, right? And the same thing with every kingdom at its time. The children are being used, knowingly or not, to help overthrow them as he said that they would be. And that's why you see in the, these battles like World War I, America and Britain, Ephraim and Menashe being used to accomplish these ends against the papal forces, for example. It's just the same theme through history. But I don't know if that happened to a park shed specifically. This is the, the, this is the one through whom uh, Abraham came. And his name actually means a congregation appointed, right? And Lud and Aram, and the sons of Aram, Uts and Hul, and Gether and Mash. And a parkshad brought forth Selach, and Selach brought forth Eber, who they don't mention in the genealogy here, which is mentioned in the genealogy from the book of Luke, and also in the book of Yobelim. There's another descendant that was born who found the writings of the watchers written in stone and copied them. He did not tell Noah because he was ashamed and he thought he'd get in trouble. But those were, those were the writings that taught him about what we call astrology or using the stars to try to prognosticate your fortune, if you will. And that's one of the pillars of witchcraft that was brought up from Ur of the Kazdim by these people and it was why these people's children were the ones that had to repent and fix it right since selach means sent and selach brought forth eber which means to cross over and to eber were born two sons the name of one was peleg for in his days the earth was divided which is what his name means 
and that was the Tower of Babel incident. Okay. And his brother's name was Yachtin. And Yachtin brought forth Almodad and Selef and Katz Sarmaweth and Yarach, which is to sow or seed, right? To scatter, right? And Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal. I didn't know that before, but remember the word for Dik or the word for Dok or Dok, Dalit, Wa, Kuf is used in the Dead Sea Scrolls throughout the calendar writings to uh, speak of the crescent moon or the first sliver of light on the moon. And it means to look for exactly, to be minute and thin. It's a very interesting word. So the Dikla could be uh, to be exact unto her. Maybe. I don't know that one for sure. I'd have to look at it, but I just thought it was interesting. came to mind when we read it right there. But an Obal and Abimael and Sheba and Ophir, which there's pretty good evidence that Ophir is what we know as the Philippines there. Okay. And Chawila and Yaobab. All these were the sons of Yachtin, and their dwelling place was from Mese or Mesha, sorry, as you go towards Sefer, a mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their clans, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. And these were the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So from all these people were all the inhabitants of the world spread out. And Ab willing, you can use what we've read here, the account that we had covered in the Genesis Apocryphon, or what's called the Tales of the Patriarchs. And again, what we'll read in Yobelim, and you can see that after the flood, these men spread out from what we call Turkey, not Africa. And they went literally to the northern parts of Africa for the sons of Ham, or Ham, except for the land of Palestine or Canaan, into the Middle East and the Far East, spreading out for the sons of Shem, and generally into Europe, or the uh, southern coasts of Europe at first, of the sons of Japheth. As we go through, and we read the history of these things, and the migrations and the things that happened, you'll see that some of the sons of Japheth would just leave, for example, when the Trojans went from Sicily to Gaul, there was inhabitants there that when they saw them, they just up and took off. No fighting, no taking stuff by force, no evil done. And if they had stayed, they would have been at Shalom with them because they didn't, they did not fight people, period. They loved their fellow man. Um, but, uh, They'd flowed, they went north, and the sons of Yepheth eventually they migrated into what we call Scandinavia. They became known as the Laplanders and the Finns, the Estorians, and a few other people. There's um the lectures by John Wilson, I believe, from the 1830s and 40s, some of the first stuff on the migrations of the children covering this topic. Uh, there's quite a few reference books that cover it. One of the great resources that we have that go into some detail about these is a book called The Missing Link Found in the Assyrian Tablets by a gentleman named Ray E. Capt, C-A-P-T. And um, I highly recommend his book. While they don't have everything entirely accurate and spot on, he gives you the facts and gives you the archaeological evidence and the things that are unequivocal that you can see the evidence of the migrations there. And he ties those things in that I just mentioned rather well. So with that being said, I think that's a great place for us to segue and uh, call it good for now. And you all have a wonderful Shabbat, a uh, Shavuot Tov or a week ahead, and we will see you next time. Thank you and Shalom.